I think you're already off the bed. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll look back at you guys. Hi, how you doing? Hello, <laughs> family. Hi, little one. How you doing? Hi there, <laughs> folks. So anyway, you sure you don't want to come up closer so we can just all talk? You know? This is what you just put in formal, you know? Yeah, I can whisper. <laughs> come sit with Uncle Bob, man. <laughs> yeah, you know? That's great. And just because you're here, I'm going to watch my potty mouth. Okay? <laughs> She's, heard. She's heard worse. So I know, but I'm going to say, if you're here, you will stop me from saying really horrible things. Okay? You'll make, you'll make me behave. You know, and I appreciate that. So, Eddie, why are we here? Well, um, I myself have been a fan of yours for a while, and I wanted to start things off by asking probably an obvious question, but what's it like seeing some of your creations come to life on the big screen? It's weird. <laughs> well, it, it, here's, here's the it, it's a two-inch sword. Because even though, like, I popularized Iron Man, you know, which was not a very popular book until I turned it into what you know now, I don't actually share in the spoils of that. So, it's kind of bittersweet, because, you know, when you hear they made $3 billion at the box office off the stuff you created, <laughs> You're kind of like, you know. But at the same time, it's opened up huge doors for me, you know. And it's like, I mean, most artists work their entire lives without having their name associated with a character, you know. And I, I've been fortunate to have my name associated with more than one character, you know, as that guy, you know, like with Ant Man and like with you know Iron Man and with the Valiant universe. So, you know, I got to tell you one story. When I went to the uh, screening of the first Iron Man. It was the first time I ever saw it, anything that I had done up on the screen. There was one shot where, because you know I designed that Malibu house in the, from the comics, right? And there's a shot, like a bird's eye shot, where Iron Man's going in for a landing and you see him start to decelerate. And I'm, I have drawn that a hundred times. <laughs> that shot and the little hair on the back of my neck stood up, you know? It was one of those weird moments where I was just like, that is so cool. I mean, it's just a feeling. I don't know how to describe it, you know, uh, to see something come to life like that. Uh, I've gotten old and jaded since then, but uh, I, I just remember that feeling of seeing something you created, you know, done on the screen, you know, in three dimensions. It's like, and it moves and it talks, and it's like, it's, it's a cool thing, you know. They've done a lot of homages to my stuff. I mean, they, they threw Tony out of the Avengers Tower and had him change his armor while he was falling. And that, you know, that was from one of my books. Uh, the recent movie, Hulk, him holding up the mountain, was from Secret Wars. Yeah. Uh, I get lots of homages, no money, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and you know, I you know, I get my credits. Usually, you'll see my credit in the movies. It's right between the guys who drive the trucks and the caterers. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, Bloodshot will be a little different because I, I just you know we finished shooting Bloodshot in October. Uh, in South Africa, that's one of the basic the Valiant character I created, right? And uh, I will actually get a credit in the beginning of the movie for a change, you know? Uh, so Marvel, Marvel's not great about that. At Birds of Prey, I created the Huntress, so, uh, you know, I don't know how they're going to do that exactly, you know? But here's, what, here's the thing people don't understand, and it's not that I need the credit or the accolades or anything like that, it's that uh, uh, I have my own film production company, and every time my name shows up on the screen, I, I can make money <laughs> because I can convince somebody to give me money to make one of my projects. You know, because look, they they made this. You know, they made Bloodshot. They made Birds of Prey. You know, you, you know what I'm gonna do? These oh, these are tied together. <laughs> this way. There you go. <laughs> okay. So much easier. I, I, I'm totally screwing up your visuals. No, aren't this I? isn't mine. I'm, the guy doesn't <laughs> even that, want to be here. This is better, you know. <laughs> but thank you for not making me sit up there. It's okay. <laughs> it just feels stupid. So yeah, it's it's a really it's a unique feeling. I, you know, it's like uh, uh, I wasn't prepared for it, especially like with Ant Man because Ant Man was like two issues that I did 40 years ago. Yeah. You know, it was like a tryout book. And now, you know, I go to Dubai, and they're like, they have tons of copies of Ant Man. How do they even get their hands on it? You know, it wasn't even printed in Dubai, you know? And I mean, it's like the thing that Aunt Scott Lang is an international phenomenon. Yeah. He could knock me over with a feather. There was no way in the world you could ever predict that. Yeah. 
You know, so it's uh, my life is weird. <laughs> cool weird, but weird, you know? Oh, very cool. Yeah. Did you ever get to talk to uh, Robert Downey Jr. or Paul Rudd about their performance? Oh, yeah. No, no. In fact, uh, uh, well, I worked on the first two Iron Man movies. I was okay. out there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was on the set of Iron Man 1 and 2. And uh, I spent a lot of time with, with Downey, actually. He was, he's amazing. He really is. Uh, of course, the whole time I'm sitting there, I'm looking at this guy. He's not a big guy, right? I'm thinking... This guy did two stretches of federal penitentiary. How did he get out of there one piece, you know? Because you know, I mean, he had a really sordid, ugly past, right? And he was about five years sober when we started Iron Man, you know? And uh, it was like, uh, I would sit with him uh, when he was to have his makeup done, you know? And uh, we'd talk. He, he had read everything I'd done backwards and forwards. He, you know. In fact, the first day I showed up, I am scared out of my mind. I mean, I'm just ready to pee myself. I'm like, you know, I said pee, I just, you know. Uh, and and I, I, they escort me onto the set, and there's Favreau and Downey, and they got trade paperbacks of my stuff there for me to autograph for them. You know, they went fanboy on me. You know, and I would that just totally threw me off. I just did not expect that, but. Uh, uh, RJ was so concerned that I approved of his performance. And I, I told him, I said, uh, I said, to be honest with you, when I first heard you were cast, I thought you were too old. Because well, you know, my Tony Stark was about 35. He was supposed to be a prodigy, you know, you know, yeah. a child genius. And so he was and it just in getting into his prime, you know, when I created the whole rock star Tony Stark persona, right? And I said, I really thought you were too old. I said, was the first time I saw him as Tony Stark in like one of the dailies, I mean, he just killed it. I mean, come on, let's face mm -hmm. it. If anybody was born to play that role, yeah. it's him, right? And, but he was actually concerned that I approved of his, uh, of course, I would have lied anyway if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are you gonna do, right? So, you know, crazy enough, when people don't realize this, uh, he wasn't Marvel's first choice for the for the role because they couldn't get him insured because of his past history, you know. And when you're on the set, you have to like ask Harrison Ford. You have to insure the guy they break, if they break a hip or something, you know. That well, no one would touch him. No one, no, no Hollywood insurance company would touch Downey because of his track record, right? So Favreau put up the money oh, wow. out of his own pocket because he was that convinced that R.J. was meant to play this role. People don't know that about Favreau, which made me, I got a lot of respect for the guy. Mm -hmm. Favreau was funny, too. He's who's, just as funny as he is in the movies. Yeah. Wasn't Tom Cruise one of the first choices for Iron Man? I know, I, really? and I, I would have boycotted the film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard Tom Cruise was one of the first choices. Yeah, he was. He was. And I, like I said, I would have boycotted the, the film. You know, I mean, I mean, come on. You know? So, yeah. Thank goodness everything worked out the way it did. You know, it was great. But he was, it was an honor to work with him and with you know, Kevin Feige and uh, the entire cast and crew. They were, they were great to me, you know. Well, I don't know if you ever saw the video. When I was, we were in San Diego for Iron Man 2, they actually physically pulled me up on stage in Hall H in San Diego, you know, which was, it, it was embarrassing because there's no steps. They had to literally like grab me by the arms and lift me up bodily, <laughs> and I think my pants were hanging down a little bit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to get me up onto the stage, you know. Hmm. And uh, but they they wanted me to take a bow, you know, uh, the whole cast. And I, I was like, yeah, that was one of those moments, you know, you have those moments in your life, because you, you do a lot of this without any recognition, and that was kind of a really cool moment until they made me get off the stage, <laughs> and then they all left through the back door on the stage. I'm sitting down in the front row and 7,000 people bum rush me. <laughs> and I'm about to be trampled. I'm literally like, cause like for the first time I got identified, right? Cause yeah. people have heard my name but they don't know my face or anything like that, right? And so they just told 7,000 people, Dad, this is the guy, right? And they all just started coming at me like this and I'm like, I'm screaming like a little girl, you know? And four big bully boys pick me up bodily like this and carry me over their heads out of the out of the place, <laughs> so I wouldn't be trampled to death. Wow. It is an experience, let me tell you. Imagine. Now, speaking of your Iron Man run, uh, probably one of the, the most well-known stories was Demon in a Bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, just curious, uh, when you guys first took it to Marvel, what they thought of that? 
you know, you, uh, people always think that's controversial, that we, the first comic to ever actually talk seriously about alcohol and have a character who has, a, you know, a chemical addiction or something like that. Uh, I always say comics are a mirror. We don't, we're not really that creative. What we really do is reflect what's ever going on in the real world. And at that particular time, uh, the Betty Ford Clinic had just opened up and people were talking about addiction openly for the first time. And the, my thrust of creating this new world for Tony Stark was to create this, this industrial empire and then the world of uh, industrial espionage and intrigue and you know, corporate machinations and all that sort of thing. And it, see, the heart problem that he had through the, the years, I used to hate it when I was a kid. When I, one of the reasons I wanted to do Iron Man is because I hated it so much when I was a kid. <laughs> it was really just an awful book. Because he would be fighting um, Ultimo, and he like on page 20, the last page, he's just about to win, and he goes, ah, ah, he'd keel over and die. You're right, you know, he'd run out of juice and have a heart attack. And I really don't know anyone who's had 50 heart attacks and lived other than Dick Cheney. You know? <laughs> and, and so, it's, it's kind of like, but even by the 70s, when I took the book over and started renovating it, uh, heart transplants were commonplace, you know? And it seemed, this, this guy's a genius who could build this suit and do all this stuff. He couldn't fix, you know, a couple pieces of metal in his heart, you know? <laughs> and it, so it seemed to me that I needed to, because I was kind of following the Arthurian legends, and I always saw him as the modern King Arthur, the sort of tortured king, and Stark Industries as his kingdom, and the Avengers as the Knights of the Round Table. And that, that, you know, but that's why one, I had to give him a friend because I realized through the entire series he never had a friend. <laughs> He's just like created Rhodey, you know. And uh, part of that creating that world was to take the heart attack thing away and create something that would always be there, the sword of Damocles, this this thing that he struggles with, the internal demons, because all great stories come from internal conflict, not external. And. As, as all you know, who are fans of the movies or the, or the comics, uh, Tony is a highly conflicted character, you know, but that's what makes him interesting. We know that he's good, but, you know, he really walk, he walks a gray line a lot of times, but he's also not somebody who's interested in fighting crime, you know? Mm -hmm. Let's face it, uh, if you get rip bitten by a radioactive water buffalo, are you going to turn into Buffalo Girl and go fight crime? Is that your? Is that what? Is that what turns you on? Is, is that the first thing you do with your Buffalo powers? No, exactly. None of us. And that's that's kind of what was my feeling about it. You know, it's like this is his world, and he protects that. And they followed that in the movies too. I mean, Cap is always arguing with him. You only you only protect what's yours. Well, yeah, don't we all? You know, because I didn't want to be. Iron Man when I was a kid, I wanted to be Tony Stark. I thought that was a more reasonable role model, you know, to achieve, you know, is because, uh, you know, they have all the girls and all the toys and all the money. It seemed like that, that's a more achievable goal than putting a tin suit on and flying around. You're, I'm losing you, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and you're the one I want to impress the most. It's the next generation that I need. I'm not getting any younger. So yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, all they told us was when we, we approached the editor about it was, do it right. That's all they said. Okay. You know? I guess we did, because 40 something years later we're yeah. still talking about it, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I've become the unofficial spokesperson for sobriety in the comic industry. You know, they actually have AA meetings where, they, you know, comic fan AA meetings where they ask me to come speak. I still get letters from people all the time saying, you know, my husband's in the Navy and he's like, He's drinking a whole lot. Is there some, you know, something, you know, something you could say to him or whatever like that, you know? And I write really heartfelt letters, you know, uh, because you know it's like that just comes with what what happened, you know. I mean, I had a lot of, I had issues in my family with alcoholism, so it, it was that's one of the reasons why that story continues to resonate 40 years later because I think it was a very heartfelt story, yeah, definitely. you know, yeah, and. I remember the, we got, this is before email, I mean, there, there were literally bags of mail coming in from people after we did that story. You know, I mean, huge tons of mail, like uh, unprecedented, just the people writing in and saying, I mean, stuff that would just make you cry, you know? Like I thought my dad was a bad guy, now I realize he has a disease and 
all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's touching, you know. So, and I always feel like it's just another comic book story, you know, but you never know what you do, how it affects other people. You know, you just do, you know, do what you like to do. You never know. Cool. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the creation of Scott Lang? Because uh, I, I guess at the time, Tim was Yellow Jacket. And yeah, and he was, a, they really had mucked with, with, Hank Pym to the point where he was actually more of a villain. Mm -hmm. I think I think when Shooter had him actually hit his wife or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm like, okay, he's gone full misogynist now, you know. But you know, every every good Marvel superhero has a hook. I, I just told you what Iron Man's hook is, right? He's King Arthur, his empire, you know, and he doesn't fight crime. He basically is he's there to protect his own interests. And altruistically, everyone benefits from what he creates, but you know that's that's his hook, right? So what's Spider-Man's hook? Well, of all the Marvel characters, he's the only one as a kid. You know, I mean, he's he's a kid, and they finally got it right. You know, where they really because I mean, Tobey Maguire was like 47 years old when he did those <laughs> movies. You know, and I'm playing a kid, but you know, I mean, you, you know. Uh, but the idea that he really was a kid, that was the, that was the hook. For, for Scott Lang, we thought, well, we're going to recreate Ant-Man. The one thing that they didn't have in the Marvel Universe was a single parent superhero, you know? Yeah. So, was, like, that was his hook, the fact that, and, and I love that the movies really play up on that, you know? Because to me, that really is the hook of Scott Lang. He loves his daughter, you know? But he's a... Uh, He's a man with a shade, uh, with a, trying to walk the straight and narrow, and at the same time, he's got all these responsibilities. And, you know, we, we never had a Marvel superhero who was a single father, you know? And uh, I, I think that was the, the, what made Scott likable, you know? The fact, and I always loved redemption stories. I mean, you know, like Doctor Strange is a great redemption story when I was a kid, you know, because he starts out as a bad guy. You know, you really hate him, and he's a real, you know, he's like, all our doctors and, and, and it's like and then suddenly yeah he you know what starts out is a selfish you know need to, to, to basically uh, fix what's wrong in his life he sees a bigger world and you know and he go, undergoes change and we, we love that right we, we all love that sort of redemption stories I always think it's really great when a villain has a change of heart you know yeah those are things that touch us you know? except right. Darth Vader yeah. Deathbed confessions don't work. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry, you do all that bad shit. Like one, thirty seconds later, you're okay, and you get to be the force, force genie or whatever. Like no, no, it doesn't work that way. What about the millions of people you killed with the Death Star? Yeah. Just go die, okay? <laughs> you know, one good deed does not erase that. All right. Sorry, I, I know you're a big Vader fan, <laughs> but don't get me started on Star Wars, okay? Because Uncle Bob hates Star Wars. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Uh, yeah, no, oh, you can just ask. You don't have to like raise hands or anything. We're just all hanging out in my living room, basically, right? <laughs> you should order pizza. What started the writing? Well, it, this is a crazy thing. I've always considered myself, and some of you can find this really weird. I've always considered myself a writer who dabbles in art. It was never my intention to be an artist, per se. I mean, I had some artistic talent. I'm not a natural artist. I struggle with everything I do, and I hate everything I do. But at the time when I started in comics, which is the 70s, there were only 35 comics being published by both companies. You had to literally wait for someone to die to get a book, or actually kill them, which I wasn't really prepared to do. Uh, fortunately, a lot of those old golden age guys were getting pretty old, you know? But so most of us worked as apprentices for years to establish artists, and that's how we got our training. I always, what's really funny is the one of the Iron Man stories that I'm best known for is a thing called Doom Quest, which is mm -hmm. Doctor Doom and Iron Man in the days of King Arthur. And I told you about my Arthurian, okay. you know, uh, you passion when I was a kid. I actually wrote that story when I was 11 years old, <laughs> on notebook paper. You know, I drew the whole thing on notebook paper. Uh, it was, I wish I had kept it. It'd be worth a fortune right now, you know? <laughs> uh, it, 
but uh, it was a story I came up with way back then. And then one day when, when David and I were, were co-planning the book, I just happened to mention it. And he's like, he was, I love that. So don't ever throw any of your ideas away either. You know, something that came up with 11 years old turned out to be like a classic Iron Man story now, you know, so just goes to show you. Uh, but from the, for the first time I started working professionally, I got involved with the writers in terms of plotting. You'll find very few books where I just did the art. Because to me, the story's everything. You know, the story is everything. All, my, my mentors always said that we are all slaves to the story. That was, that's the axiom they used. Every, every aspect, letterer, colorist, penciler, inker, everyone should be a slave to the story. And I believe that. So, like I said, you go back way back in my career, you know, you'll see that I'm involved with the plots and stories from almost the very beginning. Because I, most guys wrote at least two books a month. There were like five writers at Marvel writing all 15 books, you know? So I couldn't get a book at Marvel, you know? You couldn't get a book at DC, but they needed artists all the time because they were expanding. So. I concentrated on the art aspects, getting in and figuring that when the time was right, learn as much as I can, ask a lot of questions, learn everything I can about the medium I'm in. And when the time was right, I would, you know, venture out on my own and start writing, which I did with Hercules, the, the very first miniseries ever done in comics. It was a very stupid story, but it was fun, <laughs> you know. There was a lot of drinking involved, you know. Uh, I, I pushed the limits of the Comic Code Authority a few times, you know, but uh, I wanted to do something funny. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of romantic comedies, which they don't really make a lot of anymore. Right. And, I, you know, I, part of me, you know, there, there's always that comedic side of me that wants to do that kind of stuff. So I, I went from Demon in a Bottle to something as goofy as Hercules in space, you know, <laughs> with a transvestite and a robot, you know. Uh, uh, but that's me, you know. So, yeah, eventually, it was always my goal to be writer or artist, okay? But if I had a choice between the two, I would rather write, to be quite honest with you, because I think the story is everything. I mean, we're sitting here for a while. I mean, you guys are not fans of my art. <laughs> not most of, well, well, most of you aren't. You're fans of what the stories that I created, the, uh, the stuff that's been translated to the screen, the characters that we've created, right? The, the complexity and the humor and all that kind of stuff, that's, the heck with my art. That's not what it's about, right? It's about the fact that Tony Stark is a, a hilarious yet tragic figure. You know, it's no accident. <laughs> you know, and that's... So, yeah, to, to me the story was everything. So, yeah, I... Uh, I broke in as an artist, but, you know, I basically... Because at Valiant, I did mostly writing. Uh, the, my, the comic company I helped found in the 90s. I did, most of my work was, was as a writer. So there you go. And now I work as a screenwriter. So it's like, you know, I hardly draw at all anymore. You know, guess what comic cons are nice for? I get to draw once in a while. You know, you can doodle, as my mom said. <laughs> my mother never understood. My mother was kind of a simple woman. She, uh, she was from Kentucky, so she talks like this. I can, the, only, the only person I can do is my mom. I can do Carly. And mama's, people ask, well, what does your son do? She goes, my son's a doodler. <laughs> I told him to get a real job, and he never did. You know? I bought her a house with the, you know, the money from value. And she's like, wow, you can make a lot of money doodling. <laughs> and in 2008, she saw Iron Man. And it finally clicked. 35 years later, it clicks. She goes, that's what you've been doing all this time. I really like that. <laughs> So it took, it took 35 years for my mom to figure out what I was doing for a living, you know? But uh, even buying the house didn't impress her, you know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What was uh, the dynamic with uh, you and Dave uh, McInerney? You said it right. I did? <laughs> yeah, wow. You're the fourth person on the, on the planet who's ever said it right. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> was it just uh, working with them, and like, was it kind of like a Leonard McCartney thing where you just yeah? Kind of it was, a, off it, was a, it was a. It was I mean, obviously the visuals were me. You know, uh, all the toys were me. 
but Dave and I, yeah, we it was like a jam session. We would sit down, we would do it one way. We would have a, a, a an annual meeting where we would plot out the next year, much like a television series. We were like showrunners. Okay. We would figure out where we're going in 12 issues and have a macro story where we're heading, like Demon in a Bottle or Armor Wars or something like that. And then we would, then month to month, we would sit down and we would plot out the individual stories and how it pushed us toward that macro story that we're heading toward. You know, so, and that's how we, we kind of worked for the most part. He left the visuals to me and the designs and all that kind of stuff, you know, and he basically, but we did, because we would act stuff out. So a lot of the dialogue was both of us too, because, you know, it's like, you know, I would play Tony, he would play everybody else, because I have a smart mouth. You haven't figured that out by now, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, uh, and we would just kind of act it out. You know, it would be one night, we lived in proximity to each other, so, you know, it worked out well that way. And like I said, Dave was a great teacher for me. You know, that's how I you basically learned how to translate what I did into comics, you know, go out on my own as a writer. You know, that's why I finally left Iron Man and went out and did her, you know. Who's, who's texting me? <laughs> oh, okay. I got options for dinner. <laughs> you just said you were going to do pizza with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll spoil my dinner now. <laughs> you know, I, I, could, I, I could, we could just make a video and just uh, people can shout out names of restaurants you think we should go to. <laughs> I, I don't really care. Okay, never mind. I hope I was hoping it was somebody really funny that we could just put on camera. Uh, I've done that before. I had a girlfriend call me when I was on stage once, and I just I went ahead and took the call and put on FaceTime. <laughs> I said, "Say hi to everyone, honey." <laughs> Kirk Perez got a call from his wife yesterday, and the, the yeah, he got in the panel. <laughs> He's like, "I'm it in happens. a panel." It I can't talk. There's been a couple times we actually called somebody. You know, the, I, we crank called one of my friends. You know. Oh, yeah. We won't do that. <laughs> so did I answer your question? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Good, very good. Um, is there any superhero that you would like to write uh, write or draw for that you haven't done to yet? Uh, there were two. They're both DC characters, actually. Um, well, I don't work in comics anymore, for, first of all. People, you know that I haven't done a comic in 12 years, other than some covers once in a while. I do covers for Valiant because I found it helped found the company. I still feel like I'm, I'm kind of responsible for their behavior some, <laughs> to some degree. Uh, but um, the first comic I ever read, how old are you? Yeah, I was four years old, all right? The first comic I ever read was something called Challengers of the Unknown. Oh, yeah. And it was about four guys who, uh, their plane crashed. They, were, they didn't know each other. They were on a commercial plane, they crashed. But they were the only four guys who survived. And they were all, just happened to be, all very adventurous types, okay? You know, one was a you know, professional scuba diver, and one was a professional boxer, and uh, another one I think was a professional uh, needlepoint guy or whatever, you know. <laughs> uh, no, but the idea was their uh, watches all stopped at the moment they crashed. So this became like their symbol, the, the hourglass, you know, it's like, because they, they felt from this moment on they were living on borrowed time. And so they decided to, to become Indiana Jones, like a team of Indiana Joneses, and go out and solve all the great mysteries of the world and take incredible chances and all this kind of stuff, which also my love for non-powered characters came from that, you know? Uh, but I was four years old and I bugged my sister Sue. I said, I could tell what was happening because this was Jack Kirby and Wally Wood doing this, okay? Two of the greatest storytellers of all time. And I, I could tell from looking at the pictures what the story was. But I was so intrigued to know what the, was going on in the balloons that I, I asked my sister to teach me how to read from them. So to the point where by the time I started school, I was reading proficiently, because as you know, the vocabulary in comics is a little higher than a lot of Dick and Jane, right? So they skipped me a grade, which I thought was really great. I mean, but the graduating high school at 17 sucks, okay? Or just like, <laughs> you, you're, you're not old enough to do anything yet. So. Uh, that part was bad, but yeah, I actually, but that put the hook in me. From that point, you know, uh, the power of the medium uh, had its hook in me, and I decided that I didn't have an astronaut or fireman or policeman's phase. I was wanted to tell stories, you know, pictures and words, you know, 
that was that was my life. You know, it's it's been that way ever since. So you know, it could be like I'm fixated too. I don't know. You know, I mean, I could, I could have been a great astronaut. I don't know. I'm not afraid of heights or anything. You know, but uh, yeah. So uh, I wanted to do Challenges of the Unknown. I actually went to DC a couple times and pitched uh, a, a revamp of the uh, Challenges, a more modern version, and they turned me down. All right. And then they have a character called Adam Strange that I used to read as a kid. Okay. Adam Strange was okay. He, he, this is you gotta remember it's the '60s, okay? But he had a really cool suit with the like fin on it, you know. And he had a Scrooge gun and all this stuff. And he had jetpack and all this stuff. Now he was an archaeology guy who got hit by a teleportation beam that sent him to another galaxy, where he would be there for like three days. And he has this girlfriend who's like really really hot, but <laughs> he never gets to kiss her or touch her or anything because he always fades. The beam wears off and he goes back to Earth. But he has to fight giant tennis shoes and vacuum cleaners and stuff like this, you know, uh, until uh, until the beam wears off, and then he comes back to Earth and he has to wait like 28 days or something. Uh, I always wondered if there was some sort of significance to that, you know, it was like some sort of cosmic menstrual cycle or something. You know? uh, but when, as a kid, you know, you grow up, you read it as a kid, you thought it was so cool, right? He'd go up there and he'd fight the giant vacuum cleaners and all that kind of stuff, and then boom, he'd go back to Earth and he was just go back to being a college professor. And I always look at the other side of it. You got a college professor who says he every every 28 days he zaps to another galaxy and fights giant vacuum cleaners. <coughs> okay, not only that, because of the rotation of the Earth, he has to be somewhere at the specific site to meet where the beam's going to hit. So he has to put on his suit and go stand in the middle of the Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade, <laughs> waiting for. And I just said, I wanted to do something like I did with Hercules. I wanted to do something that was a comedy based on this, this really silly thing as an adult. That I, I mean, as a kid, I thought it was cool. As an adult, I look at it as totally silly, and I thought it would make a great comedy to do. To Adam Strange, perfect name for a guy who behaves oddly. I was actually going to have the college have him locked up at one point for being like insane, <laughs> you know? Because there's no way to prove that he goes to Iran and fights giant vacuum cleaners, you know? I always wondered how he had the money to get around the world. Yeah, well, if he's a tenured professor, you know, I'm sure, and he's an archaeologist. I mean, we, we, you know, Indiana Jones got grants, but yeah, how does he BS his way and send me to a mountaintop in Peru because the Zeta beam's going to be there, right? You know, and I just thought that the other 28 days would be way more entertaining than the fighting the giant vacuum cleaner stuff, you know, and you know, if I was him, the first thing I would do was I would skip the vacuum cleaners and go right to the girlfriend, okay? Because you know, it's like he never got to consummate his great love with her ever because they just about to kiss and he would fade away. They'd do that like, almost every every episode, you know? And as a kid, that's really frustrating, you know? <laughs> a kid in the 60s, really frustrating, you know? So I wanted to do a comedy based on that. And they looked at me like I was insane. How dare you, like, violate the canon of our beloved character who fights giant vacuum cleaners and <laughs> cosmic tennis shoes, you know, it's like, so I never did it. Did you ever draw any, like, your own, just like when you're at your desk one night and you're just like, oh, I'll draw a little No, line. I'm more thinking about the story than drawing it. You see, as I've said, that's the, because the writer in me was always thinking. I actually wrote proposals for these things. I mean, when I went to pitch them, they were written proposals for Adam Strange, you know? It was called Mystery on Earth instead of Mystery in Space because everybody was wondering what's wrong with Adam, you know? Because Adam acts weird, <laughs> you know? I mean, I, and that's, you know, that was the great thing about being an adult, remembering this stuff fondly from your childhood, just flipping the switch, you know, flipping the, the around, and it all seems really dumb. I mean, come on, how many things have you watched as an adult that you loved as a kid and you said, well, this is really stupid, you know? <laughs> you know? You, you, you have a different, you know, mindset. I'm sure there's stuff that you watched four years ago that you think is dumb now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But dumb could be good. You see, that's my point. Dumb can be really good. You know, so uh, yeah, that those are the two I wanted to do. That'll never happen now, but never know. Never. Uh, I'm not going to do any more comics. I'm done, dude. Well, you can yes. always send in your written proposals to someone else, a young person coming up that might get in there. <laughs> what do they want? <laughs> One more, and I, we're like, ordering a pizza, okay? <laughs> they want to go to Boston Pizza. No, I don't want pizza. <laughs> I'm actually <laughs> vegan, believe it or not. Does that, does that upset you? Oh. Okay. 
Okay, good. Uh, so, yeah, Edward James Olmos talked me into it. Eddie went big in about three years ago. You know who Edward James Olmos is? Yes. Yeah. You know, Commander Dama? Mm -hmm. He was my mentor in Hollywood. When I went out to work, stop! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is he still all about civil disobedience? That's what he was all about last time when he was in Panics. Toronto and we talked to him. Panics, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, that won't connect me either, okay? I'm just going to have to go downstairs and slap them. <laughs> I never see people worry about food so much in my life, you know? <laughs> uh, Eddie's always been a very uh, uh, big social activist. I mean, he's credited for ending the LA riots. You know, the famous uh, broom in the, in the dumpster. You ever read that about Ed? That, you know, when the LA riots were going on, that he walked down the street, we're calling it a dumpster or broom, you know, like, uh, and it was dangerous, but he was basically trying to get a coalition of people together to come out, clean up the mess, stop the fighting. Uh, you, you read up on him, you find out he's, but he's also f funny guy. Yeah. You know, you look at him, he's like scary, right? It's like, you know, he's Commander Adama, and he's <laughs> Castillo, uh, you know. Uh, and stuff. He's actually a, a man of really great humor. But when I, when I, after I, I worked on the first two movies, Iron Man movies, I, I branched out on my own as a screenwriter, and I wrote some television for a while. In fact, the first thing I wrote was uh, Nickelodeon. I went uh, Nick Nicktoons. I did Iron Man Armored Adventures. The showrunner said, "We've been stealing your stories for years. We might as well have you just come <laughs> and do it yourself, right?" You know. And but I hated television. Oh my God, I hate television. Well, there's too many. There's too many chefs in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, I've had enough. All right, shall we call them? <laughs> <laughs> All right, because uh, they're never going to let us finish our panel otherwise. Oh, it won't put me through. Well, that sucks. It won't put me through. This. Everybody say hi to Katie. Hi, Katie. Hi. Katie, I'm in the middle of my panel. Have, have the quit, quit texting me until I'm done, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Katie. Okay, you know what? Airplane mode goes on, all right? <laughs> Where was I? Uh, you're, supposed, you're the moderator. You're supposed to read oh, your Oh, so, yeah. So, Eddie, what happened was after I, I, I wrote a couple uh, episodes of uh, Armored Adventures, but you have to go through so many approval processes uh, when you work in television, especially children's television. And so, you know, the network, uh, standards and practices, the license holder, the showrunner, you know, blah, 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 Nickelodeon. And each one had a different color comment card, you know, line on there. And it, they contradicted each other. Love this line. Oh, this is great. This defines a character. Hate it. Get rid of it. You don't know who to listen to. You don't know who to believe. It's just like, it's, uh, it, it's insane. And after a couple episodes of that, I, I went and I wrote some stuff for uh, uh, Cin Cinemax, which better we won't talk about, <laughs> especially in front of you. Uh, uh, same problem, right? So... Um, I met Ed's son, uh, Michael, who's a writer and director, at a cocktail party for a mutual friend, and he, actually this is a funny story, I, have, I still have time to tell this, right? Oh, lots All of All right. Michael Almost, one of my best friends in the world, Michael, Michael Almost is African American, all right? So we're sitting at this cocktail party, we're at, we're at Boa, which is one of these really, I mean, you think LA's stick up the butt kind of, uh, you know, hangout place has a fire pit. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Although it's so dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face, kind of thing. 
Uh, but they were having a birthday party at Boa on Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> and we're all there, and Muffy, and there were all the other people there. And I'm sitting there talking about the story idea I had with these guys, because I know they're, they're all movie people. And movie, that's all they talk about, really, is you know, how great they all are and stuff like that. So, and I had an idea for a film. And the guy I was talking to, he's that guy don't like it. He goes, you don't show the, the bad guy at the end. He's terrible, he's terrible. <laughs> and Michael's like, no, he goes, I really like your idea. It's like, it's really great. I said, yeah, really good. And he goes, he goes, listen, my dad and I, we have a production company. He goes, uh, he goes, would you like to come out and like pitch it to dad with me? Because I think he'd be interested. And I said, here, where is he? He said, we're on the Disney lot. And I'm like, okay, so I'm like, okay, well, I not think anything of it. So uh, I go out there and I see this thing, all those productions, and it's not an uncommon name, right? You know. And I, I walk, you know, I walk in. They, and Michael's there, and they throw open the double doors, and sitting behind this big oak desk is Commander Adama. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm literally like, and I look at Michael like, <laughs> oh, he goes, oh, I'm adopted. <laughs> I'm just like, hum -da, hum -da, hum -da. I'm not prepared at all to meet Eddie. And Eddie just thought it was hilarious. But I, I started working with them, you know. Um, I wrote uh, a couple of movie drafts for them, and they, do, they did a lot of content for South America and Central America. Because Ed's like a god in the Latin, Latin world. I mean, he's, you know, <coughs> he's their Moses or something. Uh, whenever we go to a restaurant in L.A., and he goes, runs into the kitchen because all the help will come out if they find out he's there and the, the restaurant will stop, <laughs> you know? So Eddie's learned to go in and say hi to all the brothers in the kitchen before <laughs> so that he doesn't shut the restaurant down, you know? Which I think is hilarious. But so I, Eddie taught me a lot about how, tran how to translate script from a uh, uh, comic to doing film. You know, he was an amazing teacher for me. You know, we, we've stayed friends all, all these years and Michael and I are great. I worked with Michael in his last picture doing, uh, I did designs, I did designs for the thing, and animation designs for uh, one of his pictures. I, but they always pulled me into one of their things. And I, I go, and Eddie also hosts the Latino Film Festival there in LA. I, so I go every year even though I don't have a drop of Latino blood in me, you know? <laughs> I mean, I don't gringo there, but you know, it's like, you know, he considered me part of the family. And so, yeah, because the first year I was there, I didn't know anyone in Hollywood. I'd gone there to work with Marvel. They were done, and I was living in L.A. And after I met the Almoses, they just kind of adopted me. They, you know, they called me on the day before Thanksgiving and said, Bobby, what are you doing? And I'm like, um, you know, I'm like, well, I'm going to eat a turkey sandwich. And that was a vegan thing. And I, I watched football. And Eddie's like, no, you're coming out to, you're with us. You're coming out there. You know, and so I wound up doing the holidays with the, with the Almost family. So, uh, they're they're amazing people, you know. Uh, but that's where I got a lot of my learning from, you know, how to transition to to film. So a lot of stuff I, I did with them, you'll never see, either, <laughs> you know. But it was because they I, I wouldn't even know because they translated my scripts into Spanish. So I I don't speak Spanish, so I have no idea, you know. <laughs> Uh, but meeting Michael, that, that story was really funny because I mean, that's one of the few times I wish I had depends on, <laughs> you know, because I was not prepared for that. That's <laughs> uh, the magic of Hollywood, though, isn't it? <laughs> How much time do we have left? Oh, we got about 10 minutes, right? Because I like John, yeah. I'm not going to hog yeah. the whole thing, right? Yeah, about 10 minutes. Okay. Your time with uh, Valiant, you were one of the forefathers, basically. I was one of the founders of the company, yeah. Are you still, uh, still cool with Shooter? No, I was never called a shooter. <laughs> no. His time there was really actually very short. People don't realize that. Because he mismanaged the company to ruin. I'm the one that turned it around. You know? Elaborate? What? Elaborate? Uh, he, wa he wasn't a very good... Uh, he, he wasn't a very good businessman. He's a damn good writer. Don't you know what? But he brought me over there because I was always his idea guy when at Marvel. I was the guy who, because I, you know, I, I have, I, I come up with ideas for stories, just you know, walking down the street, and stuff. Just, I've always been like that, just crazy, you know, in terms of creation. And he w was looking to create a line of stuff, so he, he coerced me into getting out of my contract at Marvel and coming over there, but which I regretted almost immediately, because he had a very uh, what I would call inappropriate management style. And I, so I wasn't really thrilled about that. But 
he had blown through most of venture capital uh, investment within the first year, you know, and it's like, so you know, things were not really good there for a while. But fortunately, like I said, by the time he, the, the uh, we were owned by a venture capitalist, a group called Triumph. And uh, when they removed him, because uh, I was running the day-to-day -day operation there, and like I said, other than Harbinger, I co-created every single character up there. You know, so they already knew that I was pretty much running the show anyway at that point. But, uh, you know, the fact that they, he had not lived up to his commitments to the investors, led to eventually him being dismissed, blah, blah, blah. And then that was a, that continued on. I don't want to besmirch Jim, okay, or anything like that. Let's just say that I have a much nicer management style than his. I mean, come on, you'd rather work for me, right? <laughs> you know, Absolutely. I'm a fun guy. Everybody at Valiant had a great time. They all still say it was the best time of their lives, you know? Because everybody had a voice at Valiant, you know? We would meet like once a week, everybody would sit in a big circle, like we're doing right now. And the accountants would be over there. The janitor would be there. <laughs> and they all, they, had a, they all had a say in the company. They, they read the books. They didn't like what, where one of the characters were going. They would talk about it, you know? If they didn't like the way we're, you know, the toilet paper in the bathroom, the janitor would talk about it, you know? The accountants had opinions, you know? And everybody had a voice there, you know? And we taught art classes uh, on Wednesday nights, you know? I'd have guys like, you know, Barry Windsor Smith come in. And, and, and Stan Drake and guys like that teach art classes to these kids just barely out of art school. Mm -hmm. You can sit there with these guys who were masters of their craft, you know? Uh, and the fact that we were making just stupid money by the time the company really got profitable. So these were a lot of kids making a lot of money and having a lot of fun, you know? <laughs> and we all worked in a big, a big bullpen. Unlike Marvel, which the bullpen was always, a, you know, only in the very beginning there was a real bullpen. Uh, we actually had the old school where all most of the artists and, and everything worked up in the office. So uh, it was, and we did stuff like families, you know. I used to take a lot of them on vacation with me down to Puerto Rico or something, you know. We'd have little outings. We went, you know, we went to Key West one day in a big VW bus one time, you know. It's like, <laughs> uh, we, we did like fun stuff. It was an amazing, amazing time, you know. Like everything, it wouldn't last, but you know. Uh, and I, you know, always urge them to save their money because I said these are things that are really good right now, but it won't always be that way. One guy went out and bought a giant uh, projection television and every laser disc ever made. Yeah. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I love Valiant and the fact that uh, now we're, we're, we're going to start seeing the Valiant films. Mm -hmm. um, Bloodshot comes out in February with Vin Diesel. Cool. And Sam Hoygan. Sam Hoygan is. Anyone watch Outlander? You know, right? That's Jamie. Ah, yeah. All right. All of us with wives. Yeah, all the wives. I watch it. You know, I listen. I have a, I have a strong feminine side. Okay. I like Outlander. You know, I love that it's it's the fantasy mixed with the history and with a woman's point of view. I kind of dig it. You know, Ron Moore. He's also a great producer. Let's face it. You know. So yeah, I, I watch it religiously. So don't make fun of me, okay? <laughs> uh, Cameo? What? Cameo and Bloodshot? No, but I, uh, there is a blooper. <laughs> It'll probably be on the DVD. But uh, I got it, I got there too late. They were doing pickups by the time we got there to South Africa. And uh, do you know what pickups are? Uh, after you shot the main movie, well, they, they go back and look at it, and some of the stuff isn't quite right. So they call in the extras, and they, they, they go in and they do another shot or they do uh, more shots basically to kind of tie everything in together. So the trouble with pickups is they've already shot the main stuff. So they can't stick Bob in there. Just like, all bobbling around. Like, hi, 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 hi. I could read a uh, There was really no way to do that. But they did do a really kind of funny blooper where Kevin Van Hook and I are actually coming onto the set while they're shooting. You know, and they caught it on film. We're like, oh, we can jump back in the elevator. The elevator opens, we come out, they're like, they're shooting the movie, and we're like, ah! We turn around and run out. So it'll probably be on the DVD, you know? Uh, but it was great fun. It was, it was great fun to be there, and to see, again, to see that happening, you know? And I think it's the first of a series that they're gonna do. So, we'll see. I don't have any input on that. I'm working on my first feature film, which will actually start and I, we should talk about this before yes. we run out of time. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Uh, 
the last three years, I've been putting together my own production company. I left Hollywood and went back to Florida to be with my family. But I also uh, was putting together my own production company. Uh, anybody follow me on Facebook? Not yet. Uh, the hell with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I post on social media all the time? Anyway, well, I, uh, um, I was in Dubai for like a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago. And basically it was to secure final funding for me to make actually the first movie I ever wrote for Ed, which the one I was blah, blah, blah at BOA with, right? Because it never got made. Eddie never made the movie. He couldn't get funding for it at the time because it was a little expensive. So like in Hollywood, after you write something or whatever, after a while, it reverts back to you. So I, the rights have reverted back to me now. It's a movie called The Helix. So with my, with my, my brothers in Dubai, and with this, the help of the Swedish government, we are going to make the movie The Helix. We start shooting in September, and uh, uh, in in Sweden. But I got a great great deal with the Swedish government. It gives me uh, distribution in the EU, so it's going to open in theaters in Europe first, and that will help me sell it over here. And so all I got to do is not lose money, and everything's great, you know. But it's a terrific story. It's a, it's an adult science fiction story. It's a, uh, I'm a science buff. Probably, you guys have probably figured that out by now from all the stuff I've done over the years. Uh, I used to read Scientific American as a kid, show you what a nerd I was, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking always said that if we ever actually are contacted by, you know, alien intelligence, it's probably the worst thing that will ever happen to us as a society, as, as a civilization, because, Everything that we believe in will crumble in the face of that. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about space aliens, unless you're a Scientologist. <laughs> uh, this won't play well with Scientologists. Uh, so I really wanted to examine that in, in great detail. So I created sort of a microcosm, uh, and inside this ship with these four people, we watch what would happen on Earth on a grand scale. So it's a psychological drama, you know, uh, uh, and it is. It's it, it's it's frightening because, you know, we're really not prepared to to for that. We we are monsters. You know, we're not. We're the alien and aliens. You know, we really are. We're the scary things that go into space, and that's kind of my part of my thesis here. But I wanted to tell an adult story about what, what, what I believe would have actually happened to us as a civilization, faced with the inevitable truth that superior intelligence exists. So that's what the helix is. The helix actually refers to a marker they find uh, on the outer rim of the system that is a 200 yard long golden like, sculpture or a piece of art shaped as a DNA helix. <laughs> and it, it's, it's inert, but obviously not made by man. And then we watch everyone go batch it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And is it, that, that's the thing I love about it. The, 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 the artifact does nothing. It's how people react to it. You know, that's the story. You know, so that's what I'll be working on. That's, I'll be, that's why I'll be in Europe until November. Very cold part of Europe, <laughs> which Florida boy does not have me about. But uh, I hope every one of you get to see it next year when it's done. And no, we haven't cast yet, it's too early. Everybody asked me that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's written, produced by me. So uh, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Cool. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's only been 10 years in the making, right? <laughs> took, hey, it took Stallone seven years to get Rocky made, okay? Yeah. It won an Oscar. This will not win an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many potty words in it. You know, it's like, they won't, I won't win an Oscar. I know that. You're awful cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so any other questions for you? Okay, well, I guess we're done. Where are you going out to eat? Oh, you where are you? Oh, hell with them. I don't even talk to them now. <laughs> you know? Oh, my God. Thank, thank all of you for putting up with me. I even let any time to tell my Mickey Rourke story either. Oh, oh there's four minutes. That's going to be, oh, okay. <laughs> be funny. <laughs> I,
You all my Mickey Mouse there? Yes. Because yeah. I'm just like you guys, okay? I don't get Hollywood. Yeah. I don't understand actors. I hate actors, first of all, okay? For the most part, actors are generally egregious human beings, <laughs> all right? Especially the really big ones, you know, because they, they live in a bubble. Yes. All right. I mean, they, they're surrounded by sink defense who blow smoke up their butts all the time. Yeah. And so they, they have no way to really re interact with you in the real world. So I get on the set of Iron Man 2, right? We're out and we're shooting the uh, Grand Prix thing, right? Yeah. Which, strangely enough, was in Downey, California, oh. um, <laughs> which is a suburb of, LA, of uh, Long Beach. And the reason we were there, I asked... Uh, uh, the, uh, the co-producer, why we're there, and he says, well, because they have lax EPA regulations out here, we can burn real gasoline. I said, well, that's really encouraging, okay? We can pollute more, you know, right? that's fine. So anyway, so they have, you know what Tent City is. They have a big tent, and they have the, the banks up, and so you see Favreau, uh, he's in Tent City, and he's got the DP here, and he's got his assistant here. And so behind, in the director chairs, there's me, there's Downey, there's Justin Thoreau, right? And I look over, and like, over by the door, maybe, sitting under, under an umbrella, is Mickey Work, all by himself. <laughs> they, they've been shooting for a while since I got there, right? And so the day's going on, and I finally, I, I, I turn to Archie, and I go, why is he sitting by himself over there? <laughs> <laughs> and Robert goes, he's a method actor. And I go, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> and he's like, he's, he stays in character through the whole movie. I'm going, you're kidding. <laughs> he goes, no. I go, it's a comic book character. It's a tuna man. He's whiplash. I mean, how much like in depth do you have to go for this, OK? And, and he says, yeah, according to the rules, the contract, no one can speak to him other than the director. Hmm. So, yeah, okay, so I'm sitting here, I'm like, <laughs> all right? So, you know, the, the, it, and if you know anything about movies, that you sit there for a long time while they block shots. I mean, it, it, there's just all, so there's lots of mischief that can go on and things like that. And while they're getting ready to blow up race cars, I wasn't going to miss this in my life because we're blo really blowing stuff up, okay? Which is way fun, by the way. Uh, so at one point while they're blocking the shots and John's, uh, John's sitting there and he leans back and he goes, hey, Bob. Does he want to meet him? Yeah, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of afraid he's got weapons. <laughs> you know? I mean, he's got weapons. You know, he's sitting there with whips, right? And John says, let me talk to him. And I'll get permission for you to speak to him. I'm like, permission? Because <laughs> I'm just thinking this is the stupidest thing. <laughs> and so he walks over there. I see him like when he walks and he, he leans over and he does this, right? And I see Mickey work and he kind of looks up and goes, <laughs> to me. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> then I'm, I'm still snickering, right? And I'm like, oh. I'm just trying to hold it in. And I'm like, it's like the Batan death march of like, you know. And I get over to him and he looks at me and he goes, so you, the man who do the iron ring comic books. What? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, you sit down. I would put on good show for you today. And I go, okay. <laughs> I'm like dying, right? And I get back there, and I'm just like, do you, I, I look at RJ, and I go, do you do that? He goes, no, I'm not insane. <laughs> and I, uh, and it's like, it's, I just said, this is the weirdest thing I've ever done. And he stayed in character right up until the premiere. Oh, I wow. mean, now he worked hard. I gotta say, it was really hot. He went out there and did that whole double whip thing himself. And he did it like 13 takes, you know, until he got it right. He'd come back and go, no, I would do better. And I'm like, <laughs> every time he opened his mouth, I would snicker, you know, I mean, I just couldn't help it. Because I'm sorry, I mean, if you have to work that hard to be an actor, 
you shouldn't be an actor, okay? You should be schizophrenic, all right? You know? Because, I mean, it's whiplash. It's not Lincoln. I can see Daniel Day-Lewis maybe doing it, but, you know, it's whiplash, for Christ's sake, okay? So, yeah, that was my first run-in with method acting, which I think is bull, you know? I mean, uh, obviously. But I, I, it was the hardest thing I ever did not to laugh in his face because I just found that some part of me found it incredibly comedic, you know, that he was serious. So, yeah, that's my Mickey Work story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, true, I'm, absolutely true. <laughs> uh, thanks for being the most entertaining panel I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being the best audience. Isn't this nicer? Don't you yes. feel like oh, we're yeah. actually yeah, yeah, yeah. talking to each other and not yeah. me being a pompous ass on stage, right? But you tell you're human. <laughs> oh, I am. I, you know, I'm, I, I don't look. I, I don't believe my own hype. You know, it's like I'm just like you guys. I go home. I have to do my own laundry. You know, I don't have names or anything like that. You know, not after healing. What? <laughs> Maybe not no, after no, healing. I, no, no. I, you know, I, I have plenty of money. <laughs> I live, you know, I, I live in a, a regular apartment. I don't have a big house or anything like because I travel all the time, yeah. right? True. Uh, I have the, the realtors have sworn the secrecy that they don't tell anybody who I am. You know, just so people don't come knocking on my door. Will you sign my my pop? <laughs> you know, that's happened. You know, or they send their kids over, like, oh, go play with the cartoon man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, yeah, I, they, they're all sworn to secrecy and just let me live there. But I just I live in a regular old apartment. You know, I'm kind of a really utilitarian. Is that the point? Yeah. yeah, it's never been about the money for me. So, you know. But I, I have fun here, so that's not the point. I owned a house once. I hate it. I hate it. I hate how to keep. I hate all stuff. And I'm gone, and you know, everything just falls to crap while you're away for two weeks. You know, and so, then you go, you have a pool guy and a lawn guy and an air conditioner guy, and yeah, I, I, I don't have any guys. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> life, keep life simple, fun, right? I have a lot. I have a lot of fun. You can probably tell <laughs> for an old guy. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank thank you. You. Don't tell anyone about the Mickey work. Then. <laughs> 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 he, he never finds out, though. Perfect.